Hello, Dr. Pelto here. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching this video from the Worcester Senior Center. And uh, what you're going to be hearing is a, a replay of, of a lecture that was given uh, for uh, a number of uh, people that have diabetes or uh, have loved ones that have diabetes. I hope you enjoy this program and I hope it's uh, very beneficial for your health. Well, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming here to this uh, presentation for the Shrewsbury Public Library. My name is Don Pelto. Uh, I am a, a podiatrist in, in Worcester. We have a, an office in Worcester and in Westboro. And I've enjoyed, I've done a couple of talks for the Shrewsbury Public Library. And as we were talking a little bit before, I have a little local television program because it's nice to teach and give back to the community. And that's kind of what I, what I enjoy doing. Uh, today, what we're going to go over is uh, diabetic foot complications, and I just want to make sure if, if someone could let me know. Are you able to see that screen? Is that is that showing up? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to go through this, but this this presentation. When I do these for the community, what's really important is that you get your questions answered because you probably came here to learn something, but you you want you probably had a, a question in the back of your head. So I want to make sure I cover that. If I, for some reason, don't, you can send me a message uh, either, or you can ask me at the end of the presentation. What I'd like to go over are some of the current treatments and some of the advanced therapies for treating the diabetic foot. Now, this is a very similar lecture that I give to other doctors, other primary care doctors, or even residents, uh, because I train residents over at St. Vincent Hospital. And I, and I talked to a lot of, uh, I talked to a group of family practice doctors yesterday and primary care doctors and, and, and things like that. But I, I'm going to kind of simplify it to make it real real simple for us. What, the objectives tonight are to learn to diagnose an at-risk diabetic foot, to define the risk factors leading to diabetic foot infections, because that's what we want to do is avoid foot infections or amputation, to understand the current treatments for diabetic foot problems, and understand the incidence and economic impact of diabetic foot infections. There's going to be some kind of um, vivid pictures here. I want to apologize for that, but that's what we want to avoid and that's what we see all the time. We're going to start talking about and sharing some stories of some at-risk feet. Okay, I like uh, for you to see kind of what can happen and we'll kind of go through and I, I'd encourage you, if you have any questions, you can open up your microphone and you can you can ask me. Okay. Uh, I want to start and in, in show these two pictures here. You can show a, a picture, the one on the, that's on the left, this is a, an at-risk foot. Can anyone tell me why this is an at-risk at foot? Anyone have an idea? This picture here, what do you see that makes this foot at risk? Well, I see a sore uh, on the ball of the foot there. Yeah, so right here, exactly. What this is, this is it might it, it's a sore but what i think it is it's it's a what we call a a a, a pre-ulcerative lesion basically this started out as you can see there was a callus on the ball of the foot and if that callus gets too big it has a little bit of bleeding underneath it okay and then if you took off the callus that bleeding might fall off but what this indicates is a high pressure area okay those high pressure areas are going to eventually develop into a wound or an ulcer. Okay, that even may be a very small ulcer. If I catch a patient like this, I'm very happy because I can change their shoes, I can put padding in their shoe, I can take the pressure off of it, and many times I can avoid a bigger problem. Okay, so that's what makes this a high risk foot. There's probably a couple of other things that make this a high risk foot as well. You can see that the skin's very dry. When someone has dry skin, that makes it more prone to getting cracks in the skin. That's another reason that this is a high-risk foot. Most likely, this patient uh, probably has some neuropathy, and we'll go over what neuropathy is, but the way I like to explain neuropathy is it is where the nerves aren't functioning as they should, and you start to have either painful neuropathy, which is numbness and tingling, in your feet or non-painful neuropathy which means you, you totally lose the feeling in your feet and that can cause 
a problem because you could develop this blister and not know about it. So that's the picture on the left. And now we're going to go here to the picture on the right. This is a higher risk foot. Okay. Uh, if someone else wants to say, or even Lewis as well, why is this a higher risk foot than the one on the left? There's something missing right here. <laughs> so this patient has um, lost their big toe. And whenever we talk about wounds and diabetic feet, we always say that the biggest problem is actually a pre previous wound or a previous amputation. If you have already lost a toe, you have a very high chance of losing another toe or part of your foot or another foot. Uh, that's just what the statistics show. So whenever I have someone that's already lost a toe, and this is called a non-traumatic amputation, meaning this didn't happen from something dropping on his foot. This happened from usually an infection that goes down to the bone and we have to take the, take the toe. The problem with that is then you can see that the way that they walk, the pressure distribution changes. Do you see how now the callus is right here? Okay, there's no callus right here. The callus is over here. And, and the reason for that is the pressure distribution changes and they're putting all this pressure right here. This is gonna be very easily broken down into another ulcer because they don't have the, the big toe to take the pressure off. So this is a, a much higher risk foot. Okay, those are some, some high risk feet. And once again, if you guys have any questions, I, I wanna make sure I answer those, but I just wanted to start and show you some high risk feet. Here's another, this is a set, a right and a left toe. These are high risk feet, okay? What, what you're looking at is basically at the tips of the toes and what you see here at the tips, do you see on the right foot, the second and the third toe and on the left foot, the third toe, do you see what those are? Those are calluses at the tips of the toes. And when we, when we talk about calluses, the reason calluses need to be taken down or trimmed by a, by a podiatrist, they shouldn't be done on their own on diabetics, is because these calluses, if they go untreated, they're gonna develop, get bigger and bigger, and they're gonna develop a sore in the toe. Okay, that's how, that's how calluses work. Uh, I'm gonna stop and talk a little bit about, about hammer toes here with you all. Um, I want to talk a little bit about hammer toes. When you talk about hammer toes, there's two types of hammer toes. There are some that when they're curved, um, you can't straighten them with your finger. Okay, that's called a rigid hammer toe. The toes that you saw that have the calluses, they become rigid and what happens is when you walk, that pressure causes a callus because it's rigid and it can't be straightened. The only way to fix that is to take out a piece of bone with a surgical procedure or put something underneath the toes to give it more support like a crest pad. Now, if the toe is flexible, if you can flex it and straighten it with your hand, that's called a flexible hammer toe. That one hasn't developed arthritis in the joints yet. The arthritis are what make it not bend. If it's flexible, then there's a simpler procedure where you can just cut the tendon and straighten out the toe and it works a lot easier. So a lot of my patients that develop these, these painful calluses or these painful ulcers, I, I do a little a tendon cutting procedure. But what I, what I wanna show you is that if you would cut this tendon, let's say on this left, on this left foot here, you cut this tendon and straighten it out, the toe straight, what normally happens a lot of times is that it can transfer to either the second or the fourth toe. That's called a transfer lesion. So if, if your toes are, one's crooked and you straighten it, the other ones are gonna cramp down and they're gonna take the brunt of the punishment. So a lot of what we do is, is what we call biomechanics. It's, it's looking at, well, how's the pressure? How's that pressure affecting the toe? How's it affecting the skin? Where's the callus forming? Uh, how can we adjust that with an orthotic or some type of an insert? for our patients with, with diabetes. So those are that's another diabetic foot. Here are three other types of feet that are high risk feet. I'm gonna start with this one on the left. This is a patient, you can see on the heel, they have this big uh, scab or callus on the bottom of the heel. This patient developed a very big wound and had actually uh, something removed and it was thought to be a, a wart, but it really wasn't a wart. It ended up just being uh, almost like a, a callus that was removed and then it took a long time to heal and then that developed scar tissue. 
And this patient needs to come in every four weeks to have this really painful scar slash callus trimmed down. If this gets too big, it's going to develop into a wound. And that's something that just requires frequent care. Here's an example of another patient here. You can see their right foot, first toe, second toe, third toe. Do you see this toe? There's this blood on top of it. And this is caused, the only thing that causes blood on top of a toe is from rubbing. Okay. And this, this toe was rubbing on the shoe because the shoe was too tight. A lot of my time with my diabetics is spent talking about proper shoes. I, I think proper shoes are, are really important. So I want to just uh, stop and talk a little bit about shoes for, for diabetics. First thing you have to realize, if you have diabetes, you have a right to get one pair of shoes per year with uh, three pairs of insoles. That's covered by most insurance plans. And that's something you can ask your primary care to write that prescription for, or you can ask your podiatrist. Um, not a lot of uh, people are doing, not a lot of uh, companies are doing diabetic shoes right now because it's it's very challenging with the paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork, and uh, I don't want to go into detail, but it's kind of a challenge. But if, if you want them, and if you're high risk, and that means maybe poor blood flow, neuropathy, one of these calluses, and your shoes just are inappropriate, a diabetic shoe, and they, and they look pretty good now. Everyone in the past, in, in the past few years, they thought everyone had di uh, ugly shoes or ugly, you know, the shoes looked ugly so no one liked them, but they've gotten to be much more fashionable and and they can protect from this rubbing. And because the biggest thing I find is patients, they, and, and, and I, I say there's two reasons that people get really ulcers with, with diabetes, because normally people are doing just fine. Okay, you may live 5, 10, like we talked before, 20, 30 years with diabetes and no problems. But it usually happens from two things. One is they get a new pair of shoes or they go to a special event like a wedding and they wear a, a bad shoe and that causes a blister and then an ulcer and everything else that can happen. So usually it's wearing a different shoe or getting a new shoe. That's why it's important when you get a new shoe as a diabetic, you really evaluate it every couple of hours the first couple of days to make sure that there's no, no hot spots or red spots because you may not feel it if you have neuropathy. And the second reason for developing problems is people, let's say that you normally walk only three blocks a day and then they go decide to start working out and they walk a half mile or a mile. Okay, and that constant friction, that's something else that can very commonly cause a wound or an ulcer. So those are the two main things that I see in my practice would be, I call them event ulcers, like you go to a wedding, they go to a, a reunion or something like that, or they do a lot of walking, like they start walking out, working out. That's what a lot of people are doing during COVID now. They're starting to work out and they get all these ulcers. Uh, here's another example of a patient. Uh, this patient, you can see they have swelling. You can see the line from the compression stocking. You can see the skin's dry. Uh, you can see this wound that they had on the side of the foot. Once again, this is caused by nothing more than a tight shoe, a tight shoe that developed a, an ulcer in it. And another thing you have to realize is you may buy the shoes when you're not swollen, and then when your feet swell up, it's not going to fit anymore. So you also have to appreciate how swollen you are because that swelling can really impact things. So those are some uh, high risk fit. Here's one more high risk foot, uh, but this is on the, on the front uh, edge of the leg. And this is what we call cellulitis. And when we see someone with redness in the front of the leg, we mark it with a, a, a marking pen to make sure that the redness doesn't extend, the cellulitis doesn't extend, we give them antibiotics. But this could very easily cause problems. What we find is our patients get older, they have thinning of the skin, and then anything they, and they might be on Coumadin or a blood thinner, and anything that they hit their leg on could very easily develop an ulcer on, on the lower leg. And then finally, this is a, this is a very challenging patient here. You can see both of his feet. <sighs> and um, I just want to kind of show you, this is what we want to avoid. Um, as you can see, this is um, left foot pre-amputation, left foot post-amputation. Okay, that's the third toe, first toe, second toe, third toe. These are toe caps that are used to prevent friction. And here is uh, where, where there is an amputation and a graft. And this ulcer was doing well for a long time and then eventually got infected. So these are, are very challenging situations to treat and we want to avoid this. And you know we don't want ulcers to lead to amputations, but that, that's, that's why you see someone. That's what we want to avoid, okay? So let's go into it. Uh, we're going to talk now about really what are the, the diabetic foot risk factors. And there's an exam that's called a comprehensive diabetic foot exam. 
And this foot exam should be done by a podiatrist regardless of symptoms once a year by every diabetic. So I recommend that every diabetic be seen for a diabetic foot exam. Usually you're seeing a podiatrist for that. If you have no symptoms, then it's just once a year. It's very similar to how diabetics might see a, let's say an eye doctor. You're supposed to see one once a year. Or you may see uh, an, an endocrinologist once a year. And, and you see a foot doctor. We do a little bit more of a comprehensive foot exam than maybe your primary care. I, everyone looks at the feet, but it's just kind of how you look at it, kind of what, what, uh, what viewpoint you're looking at. And when we look at feet, we look at the, I'm gonna simplify these words. We look at the skin, we look at the nerves, we look at the bones, we look at the, the blood flow, and then we look at the types of shoes. And what we're doing is we're looking for risk areas. Like you can see on this foot here, on this left foot, that's a high risk area. That's an area that could very easily uh, break open for this patient. So let's go look, uh, first we're gonna look at skin, skin concerns. Uh, first thing can be dry skin. Uh, a lot of patients, they can get uh, cracks in the heels. This is an example of a patient with a crack in the heel and that, that opened up into a fissure. Uh, a fissure is just a crack. And dry, sh dry skin should be treated. There's something that, that also can affect when you have diabetes. When you have neuropathy, there's a type of neuropathy called um, uh, there's peripheral neuropathy and there's autonomic neuropathy. And um, I just want to stop and talk about that. So what, what autonomic neuropathy is, it's neuropathy that affects the blood flow. And it also affects the, the muscles and nerves. That's why your foot can change shape. You can develop like hammer toes that go up. You could develop dry skin, cracks in your skin. You, there's less hair growth and things like that due to the, the neuropathy. A lot of times we, when we think of neuropathy, we only think about the neuropathy that causes the numbness and tingling. But neuropathy can also affect the the sweat glands, and so you're not sweating as much. And when you don't sweat as much, you get drier skin because you don't have that lubrific lubrification from the from the sweat. So that's one of the one of the reasons for the for the dry for the dry skin. So what I, what I recommend for dry skin is doing a urea based cream, a 40% urea, U R E A. It's a very uh, good. Uh, cream that can be used to, 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 to loosen or uh, I'm sorry, uh, it can um, help the bottom, uh, bottom of the foot, okay, and, and help uh, uh, lubricate everything. Um, there is also something called sleep and heal. Basically, it's a sock with a gel in it, and you can buy these on Amazon, both this cream, the 40% urea, and this, it's called sleep and heal or like a gel sock, and you put that gel sock and that also you know, lubricates and helps to hum humidify your heels. So a lot of females, for example, they might not have cracks, but they're just, they're embarrassed with the dryness of their skin and their heel. They can do that. You can also do a, a pumice stone to like pumice off some of the hard skin. I do not recommend you trimming your own calluses if you're diabetic. I just don't think that's, that's smart for you to do. You should see someone to do that because you could go too deep. Also looking at skin, you wanna be aware of any fungal infection, especially between the toes. When we talk about examining your own feet, you wanna look between the toes because there can be a fungal infection or there can be a lot of dampness between the toes. And a lot of patients, they come in and say, well, I just took a shower, that's why it's damp. But a lot of times that dampness can be just, just chronic due to a, a fungal infection and there are some other types of problems. So if you have that, you should see someone. And the reason is because if that dampness, um, it, it's a, kind of a breeding ground for bacteria, it can very easily get a, uh, what we call a cellulitis or an infection in the skin. And what happens is that dampness, then it just gets an infection in there and that needs uh, usually a smaller surgery to, to do that. I, I've seen one person that developed it and it, it led to an amputation. So you have to be, you have to be careful about fungal infections. Uh, fungal infections can also affect the nails. Uh, everyone asks me, does every, every fungal toenail have to be treated? No, not every fungal toenail needs to be treated. Um, it's not gonna, it's not deadly. Um, it, it can cause some problems. It can cause lifting of the nail. It can cause ingrown toenail. It can cause pain. And in those cases, they should be treated. And you may just need help doing it, doing the cutting. Uh, and you can see a podiatrist for that. Uh, calluses, once again, there's different areas of calluses. And as I showed you in the beginning, if this callus, for example, on this picture on the right, isn't treated over time, it can develop a blood blister down there and that could develop into an ulcer. Here's another type of a callus. This is called a, a porokeratoma. And all that means is a, it's a pore like a sweat gland with a callus in it. So it almost looks like a piece of corn that you shove in the foot. And this has to be cut out 
kind of deep wise with a razor blade to get that out and that's that's done in the office so once again these should be trimmed down and this, these types of patients they would do well with an orthotic or some type of a diabetic shoe uh, calluses once again why are why are we why are we treating calluses calluses are always precursors to wounds so you're never going to see a wound without a callus first okay unless it's like a blister from someone doing a lot of walking but usually ulcers happen in areas of callusing there are calluses um, between the toes. That just means interdigital, just means between the toes. And this is an example. You can see the bones were drawn on the skin here. And uh, these bones, when they hit against each other, they develop a really big callus between the toes. And these can be trimmed down. And there are different types of procedures that can be done to help with this callusing between the toes. But these can be very painful. They're made worse with tight shoes. Uh, they could cause an infection as well. So a callus between the toe is very uncomfortable. Uh, also talking about skin issues, uh, th with the nails, there can also be nail problems that can happen. Um, I'm talking here about ingrown toenails, and there's different types of treatments we use. Uh, if, it, if it's a typical one here, you can see before there's swelling around the edge, there's pain, and we normally just take the edge out and, uh, and then it, let it grow back. If it happens a couple of times, there's another procedure where we can put a chemical in the edge of the nail, and that, that portion, so this little portion of the nail just never grows back. And then finally, there is a newer treatment called Onifix. It's basically an external brace, very similar to a, um, with, with braces. After you have uh, braces, they put a retainer, and that retainer holds the shape. So it holds the shape like this, and as the nail grows out, this, this retainer stays on the nail and grows out with it. You can see here on this toenail, it was placed on and helped straighten it out over time. That's a newer, a newer type of a treatment for ingrown toenails. Once again, diabetics shouldn't be tr trimming out their own ingrown toenails. They should, they should see someone for that. And now these are some stronger pictures. I just want to let you guys know, those that are watching. Um, wounds are, are a big issue. So here's an example of a, of a wound on the bottom of the foot that uh, eventually just kind of healed up. Okay, and there's a callus there. So this needs to be treated. This, this person, let's see how flat this foot is. This happened, this turned into a Charcot foot because the foot totally collapsed. And we'll talk about a Charcot foot in a little bit. This is what we want to avoid. Charcot, Charcot feet are always found on people with neuropathy. They can't feel anything. And so they pretty much break their foot and they keep walking on it. Here's another really bad infection right here. You can see the redness and these types of things um, to need to be treated, okay? Uh, we're not gonna go into too much detail on, on the wound healing aspect. If, if anyone has questions, you can certainly ask me, uh, but I, I don't wanna go into that too much. We're trying to avoid the wounds. Um, with, uh, with nerve, we want to talk about the nerves. The nerves can be affected. There's two things that your doctor should check when they're checking for neuropathy. One is with a tuning fork. What you do is you tap the tuning fork and create a vibration. You put it to the base of the bone at the tip of the great toe, base of the tuning fork, and you ask them to tell you when the, the vibration stops. And so this tends to diminish first. Uh, in our, and, and then there's also this other one where they take, uh, it's called a Sims Weinstein. It's that little piece of plastic and they touch that on primary sites, which are the big toe, first, third, and fifth metatarsal heads, and the other, some other places. And these will determine if you have neuropathy. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, about neuropathy with patients. Uh, with Neuropathy can be very challenging when, when treating it uh, because it, it tends to be progressive for patients. So like this year, you may, you may be able to feel fine, but then next year, it may be worse. It's made worse because of elevated blood sugar levels. The way I kind of explain it, is the the nerves in your body are 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 fed always by blood flow if, if you think about it when a child is born if you cut the the blood flow off to their brain for a minute they're going to go brain dead right so blood flow is very essential to nerve health does that make sense so you have mm -hmm. to have good blood flow that's why whenever you see a nerve there's always two two blood vessels right next to it to feed it now, now think about this. If you have elevated blood sugar in your blood vessels, that's gonna injure the nerve. And it's gonna affect the nerves that are smaller. In the smallest nerves from your spinal cord, the nerves start big at the spinal cord, and as they go further and further down, they get smaller and smaller. That's why in the toes and in the fingers, they're the smallest. So the nerves are the smallest, and the blood vessels are the smallest. And, and there's a lot of science behind it, but, but the simple way of thinking about it, that's, that's why there's, there's a, a, a glove, they call it a glove and, and stocking distribution of neuropathy. That's where it's most common in the hands and the feet. 
because those those vessels are so small and it causes changes in the nerves. What's the best thing you can do to reverse neuropathy is strict blood blood sugar control and even trying to reduce to to reverse your your um, your your diabetes. Okay, and uh, reversal of diabetes is possible, and not many patients I know have been successful at doing it because um, it's you know most most doctors are, are very are just doing medications. There's a really good book, and when I did my other lecture here. I talked about, uh, uh, we were talking about diet and weight loss and things like that. It was a lecture on intermittent fasting. There's a good book called The Diabetes Code. I recommend all my diabetics read. It's called, it's by Jason Fong, F-U-N-G. It's called The Diabetes Code. And he has a really good explanation uh, for diabetes and he kind of helps patients to reverse their diabetes. Now, once again, I am not a diabetes doctor. You have to talk to your doctor to get actual, you know, care and, and, and you know, they're the ones that are going to be taking you off medications if that's indicated and things like that. But um, neuropathy, the best thing for it, you know, there are medications, but those medications only treat the symptoms and they don't really reverse it. Gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, all these medications can help, once again, the symptoms, but they don't reverse the neuropathy. When you stop taking the medications, they stop working. There is some thoughts into uh, vitamin deficient, deficiency that can cause neuropathy. And um, so supplementation of things like folic acid or B12 uh, and things like that sometimes can be beneficial. You should talk to your doctor if you should supplement uh, for to help with neuropathy. Uh, because certain medications like metformin, for example, can deplete you of some vitamins and, and things like that. That could cause neuropathy. Once again, that's a talk, that's a discussion with your doctor uh, about how to or if you should be doing something like that. Okay, so that's uh, the neuropathy aspect. Uh, we talked a little bit about foot deformities. That's what I started with. Um, there are different types of foot deformities. The most common ones I see here on the left are the hammer toes. In the middle is a hammer toe. Here's a hammer toe and a bunion. And here's a really bad bunion and a hammer toe. Uh, foot deformities can be problematic in anyone, but with diabetics, it could, it could cause ulcers. And the problem is they might not feel them. Okay. So there are a lot of different types of musculoskeletal or, or foot deformities. Um, I want to spend a little time uh, talking about preventative foot surgery. So, so for some types of bunions and hammer toes, we do a, a surgery to help prevent ulceration in the future. And there are surgeries that we do for that. And this is a condition um, called Charcot that I was talking to you. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it in, in a little bit. But if you, if you look at it, a normal foot has an arch like this. And this is a collapsing arch. It, ha it, it happens most of the time in the middle of the foot. It can happen also in the ankle, in the back of the foot, in other places as well. But this type of a Charcot deformity is pretty much, in my opinion, it's not the worst thing that can happen, but it takes a long time for these patients to get better. So you're looking at like six months of x-rays every month and, and staying off of it with a walking boot or a crow boot. Um, specifically, let me show you what Charcot is. So Charcot... Um, is uh, it's not Charcot Marie tooth, by the way. It's that's a different diagnosis. Charcot is when someone develops a red hot swollen foot, and it looks something like this. It's very commonly misdiagnosed for cellulitis or a a, a, a bone break. Okay, and what happens is a normal arch then collapses down, and, and occasionally, depending on where it's at, where that where that prominence is, it could develop a sore in that area. Um, how do you do this? Well, if there's a broken foot, normally a broken foot takes six to eight weeks, or up to two months to get better. But with someone with Charcot, what happens is there's a lot of um, there's a couple of different theories behind it, but there's a lot of blood flow that goes to it, and it kind of washes out the bones. They become very weak, and then it, it takes up at, at a minimum of six weeks. You have to totally stay off your foot. And how do you do that? Well, you start out with one of these knee walkers, the knee rollers, and then you might go into this brace that has. Um, it puts all the pressure underneath the knee and then you could also go in this boot it's called a crow boot and this crow boot basically it, it, it just distributes all the pressure throughout the lower leg and takes the pressure off the foot so this is one of the most challenging things that we see that I, I wouldn't want anyone to have but you always have to have um, like pretty profound neuropathy to have it this isn't a painful it doesn't hurt because you don't have any feeling that's that's the whole problem with these wounds is that they don't hurt um, I want to talk a little bit about circulation. Um, so once again, circulation, I put this uh, Charcot as well, which can be caused by 
you know, usually there's really good circulation in a Charcot foot, like bounding pulses. You can feel the pulses. That's, that's the Charcot foot. The other foot that I see are people that have poor blood flow. And uh, what this a picture is here on the left, this is a, kind of like a rotor rooter that goes in and clears out the fat in the arteries. Okay, it kind of clears things out. That's what vascular surgeons do many times. Um, if I can't feel the pulses, I have a Doppler in the office, which is something that kind of, you can hear the waves that goes, whew, whew. you can hear those in the foot. Uh, and then sometimes you can do an ankle brachial index, which is another exam you do in the, in the hospital or in the office, and you evaluate how the flow is. And this is an MRA, is a, like an MRI, which is for bones, but an MRA is for arteries. And you can see where the, cl where the clogging is in the arteries. And a lot of times we work hand in hand with uh, circulation doctors. But the main thing I want to talk about is some patients that say they have an ingrown toenail might not be an ingrown toenail. That, that painful edge of the nail it could also be caused because of poor, poor, poor circulation. So you have to be careful. Okay, uh, that that that's something you, you should see a professional about. If, that's why with an ingrown toenail or something, or a non-healing sore that doesn't get better, a lot of times that can be circulation. And just a little bit about about circulation issues. Um, the issue with circulation issues is it, it tends to progressively get worse. And the way I like to think about it and rationalize it is. For example, if you got um, clogging in the artery in your neck, that's called a, that happens that causes that get, you get a stroke, right? Everyone knows what a stroke is. We're all aware of how harmful a stroke can be. But all it is is it's clogging in the artery in the carotid. Uh, if you get clogging in the artery in the heart, it's called a heart attack. Okay, everyone knows what a heart attack is. Everyone is aware of that. You know, you don't want that to happen. But what no one really thinks about is clogging in the legs is called peripheral arterial disease or PAD and it the, the symptoms are very similar you can get like cramping in your in your legs meaning you can walk a couple blocks and you have to rest for a few minutes until it feels better and then you can walk again those are very commonly misdiagnosed issues people just don't see that because it's not like you're like with a heart attack you know or the carotid where you pass out with the legs it's one of these things that just gets worse over time and and so a, a good a good uh, you have to find a good cardiologist they should be testing what I do for diabetics is starting at the age of 50 I do the a test where they put blood pressure cuffs on the legs it's called an ankle brachial index so I compare the blood pressure to the arm and I compare it to your legs and, and it should be one uh, it should be equal ratio and it, as it gets off then we may have to do other exams but for diabetics at the age of 50 I start evaluating for that in the office to see if there's any any issues going on that you might need some care for Okay, and then we can send you to a circulation doctor or something. It very commonly misdiagnosed, very commonly not seen until it becomes a problem. And for most feet, for example, you know, you're, you're fine until you develop an ulcer. But once you get that ulcer, you're never going to heal it because you, you don't have the flow down there. And then the other thing that's a problem is if you don't have the flow, how can we give you an antibiotic? Because the antibiotic goes by the bloodstream. And so that, that antibiotic won't get down there to work. And that's why you need to give someone a stronger one via the vein, an intravenous antibiotic. So it's a, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Circulation is a, is a big issue for our, our, our diabetic patients. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about shoe gear. And I'm a big stickler for, for shoes, especially with the type of shoes and the fit of the shoe. Um, not for everyone. Let's say you're a, a young diabetic or a diabetic with no foot problems like hammer toes or bunions or, and you have great circulation and, and great feeling, probably not a big issue. But if you have neuropathy and you can't feel, or if you have a foot deformity like a bunion or a hammer toe, or you have poor blood flow, or I think as I said, neuropathy, then you should really be careful about your shoes. Um, I recommend a lot of anatomic shoes. And what I mean by that Typical shoes, they tend to be tapered. You see how it's tapered at the toe? Our feet aren't tapered, okay? So every time you put it into a tapered shoe, it's gonna, it's gonna compress the toes. This is an anatomic shoe. So even if you're not buying diabetic shoes, this one is anatomic because it's, it's according to the anatomy of your foot. And there's a couple of good brands I recommend. Um, I recommend um, Topos. And ultras, you may have never heard of these names, but Topos and Ultras, and they sell them in Shrewsbury, since we're talking in Shrewsbury, at Marathon Sports. They're in, in, in White City. And also across the, the, the lake there, they sell them at Sneakerama as well, those types of anatomic shoes. And the big tip I, I tell people is that um, you want to 
on the on the lining or the liner of the shoe, you pull that out and you step on it. And then if your foot goes over that, then it's probably too narrow for you. Okay, or if you're developing calluses, a lot of the reason is a shoe that's too narrow. Um, you want to be careful of the insoles. Some people patients need orthotics. And then uh, socks, once again, you don't want socks that are going to compress too much. There are diabetic socks, and really all they do is they don't have seams in them, and they don't put a lot of uh, pressure or cause rubbing. I haven't really seen, everyone talks about diabetic socks. I, I haven't really seen them make a huge difference, except they're just not as tight, especially if you have swelling. Okay, I, I, I can't say I, I've seen like ulcers avoided because someone always wears diabetic socks, but if you have a lot of uh, swelling, the other traditional socks, they really kind of cut off the circulation due to the swelling. Um, here's an example of a diabetic shoe. Uh, this one has a stretch material on it. It's a Velcro. And then I wanted to talk to you about the um, the inserts that go in there. They're called a multi-density insert. What that means is they have three different densities, three or, three or four different density um, um, on top of it. They're all put together in a real thin insert. And these are changed every every four months, so you get three sets of these for your shoes. And what these are made to do is they reduce friction. So these are good for patients with calluses or areas that are close to developing an ulcer, and they can take the pressure and friction off for you. Okay, that's, that's about shoes. Um, these are some problems I've seen. So these are different patients of mine that have developed problems, and these are all shoe problems. So once again, missing some toes, developed a blister here, an ulcer, another blister here, another blister due to a, a toe, a shoe issue. And you can see a lot of these patients are missing um, missing digits, right? And so these are kind of complexities. You have to be careful. Uh, you don't want to cause problems. Um, I don't want to go into the, the details too much uh, about diabetic foot ulcers, but I just want to say that it is one of the most common complications of diabetes. The annual incidence for diabetics is 1% to 4%. So out of every 100 people, one's going to get an ulcer every year. Lifetime risk, now, and the reason the lifetime risk is only 15 to 25%, so one in four is going to get an ulcer. If the annual incidence is more, it's because a lot of times they come back multiple times. Now, this is the, the key that you have to be aware of. 15% of diabetic foot ulcers result in lower extremity amputation. So of, of those that get ulcers, 15% lead to an amputation. That's what we want to avoid. Now, this is even more shocking. 85% of amputations with people with diabetes are preceded by ulcers. So basically all amputations are, are started by an ulcer, okay? But only 15% but only go on to it. So yeah, that's why we wanna avoid at all costs an ulcer. We have to be careful of shoes. And uh, peripheral neuropathy is a major contributing factor in ulcers, so not feeling, right? It makes sense, because you can't feel it. Um, over a two year period, um, the cost, it's very, very expensive. You know, in 2008, which we're 10 years out on that or more, it's probably closer to 80,000 now. And this is the one thing that shocks people. If you look at, we, we're, we're, we have a, we're always know about the mortality rates of different types of cancers like breast cancer, Hodgkin's cancer, colon cancer, ischemic, or PAD, other types of cancers. So like having an ulcer, the five-year mortality, meaning you're gonna die within five years, is about the same is having an amputation or having colon cancer. So there's a, a big mortality rate with an ulcer. That's why we're trying to avoid these, okay? And, and an ulcer is the same mortality as an amputation. So there's, you know, in five years, people that have amputations, because it's only the tip of the iceberg, that's the reason, is because you're, so, you're talking, it's not just the amputation or not just the ulcer, but they probably have neuropathy, probably have kidney issues, they probably have a lot of other things. So it's very, very... Um, important uh, to keep an eye on this. So what are the recommendations that we're giving you here tonight uh, if you're diabetic? At a minimum, see uh, a diabetic uh, a podiatrist for a yearly comprehensive diabetic foot exam. Um, yearly get diabetic footwear and change your inserts every four months. I recommend writing the date that you should change them on the bottom of them and put it on your calendar. Uh, every two to three months, you should get foot care. If you have symptoms, meaning if you have a poor blood flow, or if you have neuropathy, or if you have nails you can't do, or things like that. And then daily, do a foot evaluation with a family member and look at your feet. If you can't look, have a family member look, or you can use a, an iPad or something else like that. Um, everyone asks me who qualifies for diabetic callus and nail care. Um, so you have to have diabetes and something else. It's not just diabetes, not everyone gets their nails and calluses done. And usually you have to have um, circulatory issue or neuropathy and calluses and things like that. 
Um, who qualifies for diabetic shoes? You have to have either a previous amputation, a history of an ulcer, a, a callus that with the blood underneath it. It's called a pre-ulcerative callus. You have to have neuropathy, a foot deformity like a bunion, hammer toe, something like that, or poor circulation. So that's most people. Okay, those are who qualify for diabetic shoes. Um, I use this lecture for um, some some residents. And they asked me for some board questions, so I'm not going to go into the board questions. Um, but uh, I just wanted to to end there. I wanted to see if if anyone here had any other questions that I didn't address. I think we talked about neuropathy. Um, any other questions that you guys had, you could write it, write it in the chat or you could ask me right now. Um, I had a question. Go ahead, Leah. Um, sure. I was going to ask, um, I've never really seen diabetic socks, but do they have like winter diabetic socks and summer diabetic socks? That's a good question. I don't think they really, I think they have one type of diabetic socks. I, I, I don't think, once again, I don't think there's a big difference between a winter and a summer sock. Um, all I know is they tend to have like this, almost like this netting that doesn't compress on the legs. And they're usually for people that have a lot of swelling. I usually go to just, you can go to Walmart and get them the, the cheapest for usually a dollar a pair or something like that. But I don't think they have anything different winter and summer. Oh, okay. And then I just had one other question. Um, so like if someone with diabetes is cold and they put a pair of socks on, is it good to put like two pairs of socks on? Or, I mean, I don't, cause you talk a lot about the pressure and like the seams of the socks. Yeah. So the, I've seen a couple of problems with people putting two pairs of socks on. It's usually not from the socks. It's usually from then if they put two pairs of socks and then they go back into their shoes, the shoes are too tight and that's what causes the problem or it's too tight on the, on the, on the, on the toes. Um, two pairs are probably fine as long as the shoe is big enough and the sock isn't too tight. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there, there was a question about the shoe brands. When we're talking about anatomic shoes, now once again, these are not diabetic shoes. Okay, these are anatomic shoes that are bigger in the front. I recommend Topo, T-O-P-O, -O, Ultra, A-L-T-R-A, -A, and Lems, L-E-M-S. And, and, and some of those are what we call zero drop, meaning they're kind of like wearing flat shoes. So you should really just go to a shoe store and maybe ask your doctor what, what would be most appropriate for you. If you want diabetic shoes, you would have to go to a podorthist. And there, that's a person, and we would give you a prescription for that and, and send you to a podorthist that could get you the diabetic shoes. You, you can try buying them online. Um, Dr. Comfort is one that sells them. But the problem is they won't get you the inserts that go into them. And insurance usually covers them. Uh, does Medicare cover those shoes as well? Yeah. Yep. Medicare covers the diabetic shoes. Yep. Um, if, if you want to be proactive, I, I would say um, find a good vendor. And we have a list at our office if you want to contact me or, or just call my office uh, at, at centralmasspodiatry.com. That's our website. But you can just contact us. We'll send you the list. There's, I think, three vendors around. There's not that many. People that used to do them, they don't do them anymore because the paperwork is kind of horrendous. A lot of paperwork. A question on polyneuropathy, right? Uh, with regards to uh, tingling and other things, does tightness of muscles on your leg also also an indication of uh, of polyneuropathy? So the question, yeah, is, is tightness or like a tightness in the calf? I think yeah. uh, tight tightness in the calf or the palm of the of the foot. Yeah. I, so once again, I think. In my opinion, tightness or what we call technically is called equinus or a tight calf muscle or just tight muscles in general is the root of all most of my foot problems that I see, such as Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, other types of things. OK, mm -hmm. I think in, in, in it's the problem is we're in a society where we're sitting down all the time yep. and we're putting our, our kids in shoes and we're making them sit down all the time. So I think tightness should be dealt with. I think foam rolling really works well. I think stretching really works well. Um, on my blog, it's drpelto.com. I have a lot of foam rolling exercises and, th and things like that. But does tightness cause polyneuropathy? No, it does not. They're totally different things. Okay. But I think the tightness, what research has shown in diabetics, especially what they have is they have the changing of the tendons. The tendons actually become tighter. And because of that, your foot doesn't move as much. And because of that, less range of motion, you're more common to get high pressure areas, calluses and ulcers. So it's, it's a really big problem with diabetics, but it, it doesn't, tightness does not cause neuropathy. Or, or is tightness an indication of not neuropathy too? That 
Tightness is not. Tightness okay. is not an indication of neuropathy. Neuropathy, the only indication would be you can't feel the vibration, you can't feel the touching, or you have like numbness and tingling. Um, num but also numbness and tingling can be caused by other things. It can be caused by tight shoes. It can be caused, you know, by, uh, by other things as well. Um, or vitamin deficiency, like we talked about. Um, so I would have your doctor check for the neuropathy. I personally um, don't, like my patients, like either they're profoundly neuropathic, they can't feel anything, or they have like this this painful neuropathy and 90% of the time they have it at night when they're sitting in bed. That's what they complain to me about is I'm in bed and my, and my feet are num numbness and tingling. And you have to determine is that neuropathy or is that poor blood flow? It could be one of the yeah. two. And, um, or, or it could just be, you need like, um, quant tonic water because of the cramping and, you know, other things like that. Okay. Good questions. Okay. Um, I had, a, I had another question. Um, I had seen in one of your pictures that you had a callus over a bunion. Um, but like, what, what is a bunion? Like, is it the muscle in the bone or is it just the muscle or? Yeah. Um, so what is a bunion? Okay. So let me, we're, we're on a, I'll just show you here. So what is a bunion? So in, in my, in my practice, I use these Google slides all the time. I don't know if you've heard about just Google slides, but this is what I use in, in my, in my treatment rooms with my patients to explain things. So this is a bunion. Okay. I know this isn't really our topic, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but, um, there's mild, moderate and severe. And what a bunion is, is um, a bumping out of the bone right here. This is a fixed bunion. This is, I'm kind of showing the, the shoes, but this is a bunion. The bump goes out right here. And if you look at some x-rays, here's a bunion. See that bump that goes out? And this is a bunion that's fixed with surgery. So, but this is the bunion right here that goes out. Does that make sense? That's what that is. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Good. Other questions? So, uh, question with regards to polyneuropathy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, with regards to in the night, uh, does the uh, does polyneuropathy cause coldness and hotness in the feet? There's a lot of different symptoms of neuropathy. And in my experience, once again, 80% of patients have numbness and tingling at night. That's mm -hmm. when they feel the neuropathy. And my thoughts for that is you have uh, your spinal cord and there's a lot mm -hmm. of different types of nerves. There are certain nerves that feel hot and cold. There's nerves that feel vibration. There's nerves mm -hmm. that feel position. When we're busy throughout the day, we don't feel our nerves as much because you're just busy walking, moving, things like that. But when you're sitting in bed at night, you feel everything. And you're just aware of everything. And that's where you're like, whoa, you know, what's going on? And, and that's where you start to feel that nerve pain. And I kind of equate neuropathy to like a light bulb. Like a light bulb, before it goes out, it starts to flicker and go on mm -hmm. and off. And eventually it's going to go out. And that's how it feels, uh, that kind of flickering. Um, th that's why, it, it, in my opinion, it hurts more at night because um, you're just more aware of it. Now, coldness, coldness has nothing to do with neuropathy. Coldness is just coldness. And... And the coldness, it could be, you know, a lot, it's usually not blood flow issues. If you have good pulses, it's just your feet feel cold. I have a lot of my patients, they just have cold feet. Okay. Um, but it, the coldness does not associate with neuropathy. They're, they're, they're cold okay. associate with poor blood flow. Yeah. All right. Uh, there is a, yeah, I think, yeah, why is neuropathic? Another question that came in. Yeah, I just answered it about neuropathic pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good questions. Um, I had another question about calluses. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you had said like all these things that we have seen on the bottom of people's feet are caused by the pressure. Now, like if you have the characteristic of being overweight, which is sometimes seen in diabetic people, is that like a bad characteristic to have that would cause you maybe to have more calluses or? I... Yes. So di uh, the, the more weight we carry on our body, the more calluses we're going to have. Uh, the more pressure you're going to have on your feet. So calluses could be worse. Also due to neuropathy, it could have a autonomic neuropathy, which you're less sweating, so you develop more calluses. Um, also, depending on the shoes, there could be more friction. There's less cushion in those shoes. All those things can be causing uh, calluses. Now, just so you know, calluses in and of themselves are a natural phenomenon on our feet. 
not all callus needs to be treated. Okay, calluses are like totally normal. It, it, it kind of like calluses when you work a lot. You're going to get calluses on your hands. I'm not worried about calluses. What I'm worried about is if they have pain or if they develop blood underneath that callus. Okay, or if they have poor blood flow or they can't feel in which case that could develop into an ulcer. So just having a callus, like a lot of my patients that have bunions, they have a little callus right here on the big toe or calluses in other spots. That's not as uh, as important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question, Dr. Donald. Do you recommend any of any any brand that, that comes off the top of your head with regards to the 40% urea-based cream? Yeah, they're all about the same. I would the cheapest one is probably on Amazon. Just look for a forty percent urea. Okay. Um, I, there's no that's the cheapest one. We carry one in our office. I don't think it's any better than the one on Amazon though. Okay. Yeah. And certainly, I just want to. I'll, I'll put my my email up up one once again. If you guys have any questions, I kind of like doing this and answering questions for people. So if you have any any questions, I'm just gonna share this screen one more time you can feel free to email me here's my uh is my email up here no it's not so let me i should have put it on here sorry about that let me add it right here it's a don at central mass podiatry.com okay so that's my email if you guys have any questions you can feel free to email me um i just i like doing this like helping the community and uh, once again, if there's medical questions, don't send pictures to me. <laughs> okay, it's obvious. Um, don't don't send you know anything that would break HIPAA or anything else like that. But if you have a quick question, I'd be happy to answer anything. And if oh should I come in to see you or not, I can certainly field that either over the phone if you wanted to call me uh, or email me. And and uh, where are you located in case if I want to come and yeah. visit for a doctor's We're, appointment? Yeah. Our office is in Worcester. It's right next to Hanneman Hospital, two ninety nine Lincoln Street. Okay. in Worcester, and then we have another one on 24 Lyman Street in Westboro, which is closer yeah. to Shrewsbury. Uh, we're in that. There's oh, you're, you're in Lyman Street, yeah, too? Yeah, 24 Lyman Street. Sweet. I think it's 180. We just oh, moved. that's Westbury, right? Westboro, right? Westboro. We just moved there. Yep. It's okay. a, new, a new location for us. Okay. Um, could you repeat your email address again? Yeah. I just, I don't see it on the screen there, just the way the screen is. Okay. Sorry. It's uh, D-O-N, Don at central c-e-n-t-r-a-l-m-a-s-s -S, podiatry p-o-d-i-a-t-r-y dot com central mass podiatry yeah on the phone it's kind of hard to see things thank you okay you guys had great questions um i look forward to doing it again uh pira thank you so much for inviting me from the library to do this thank thank you so much dr thank you have a good thank night you. everyone thank you.